Have you ever heard of common descent? It's the idea that all living organisms you see today, no matter how different they are, share a single common ancestor. Through this ancestor, all life advanced through evolutionary changes. Is this possible or far-fetched? Scientists aren't so sure either. Coming up next, The Miracle of Development, Part 2, with Dr. Paul Nelson. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Origins. My name is Don Chapman. It's my great privilege to be your host. You know, Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. Our guest today is Dr. Paul Nelson. Dr. Nelson, it's so good to have you Thanks with us. Thanks for having me. I need to tell the folks that you're a professor at Biola, that you're a fellow at the Discovery Institute, and that you love God and you're a philosopher of biology. I think that's a fascinating combination of words. Yeah, you know, uh, when I was a graduate student, I took as much biology as the philosophy program would tolerate. But when I ran into some problems in biology, I'd often need philosophical tools to solve them. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. Well, since you're a philosopher of biology, I, I want you to answer a question. You know, I've got questions. Yeah. I'm out hunting in a tree stand. So I, I'm waiting for this beautiful deer, which seem to be these incredibly shaped animals. But I'll see other of them. I'll see a turkey, you know, coming through on two legs. And I'll watch a, a snake or a worm crawl by and a rabbit with its long back legs hopping. Uh, personally, I have a hard time seeing that evolution can explain the variety of forms. Can you help us with that? You know, it's, I think the central difficulty facing evolutionary theory today how this diversity of animal form came about from a common ancestor. In fact, uh, a biologist in Georgia, very insightful geneticist, has called it a great Darwinian paradox. That's actually his phrase, that this puzzle is so deep that we need to rethink how we approach the question. Here's how he put it in a paper that I read as a student. And it was nearly 30 years ago so this is a problem that's been around for a long time and it's still not solved. He said, 20 years of research on the genetic basis of evolution has led us to this term that he called the Great Darwinian Paradox. And I think today in 2012, the problem is even more difficult to solve. Um, it has three dimensions. Or you can think about it this way. It arises at the intersection of developmental biology the theory of common descent, which is the idea that all animals share a common ancestor, and the theory of natural selection. So at the center of those three circles is where this problem lives. All right. Let me show you up on the board. I would appreciate that. Now, the paradox what John McDonald calls this great Darwinian paradox, can be seen as a three-point argument. Here's the first point. Animal body plans are built in each generation by a stepwise process. So think about human development. You start with a single cell, the fertilized egg. You have a nine-month interval as the embryo is growing. And what's happening is that cell's dividing and dividing and dividing from one to thousands to millions to ultimate, ultimately trillions of cells uh, in the adult, and that happens in an incremental way. It takes a long time, depending on the species in question. We know this. This is well established from developmental biology. Now, here's the second part of the problem. If you're going to change a body plan, and by a body plan, I mean the overall architecture of an animal, you've got to start early, because that's where the body plan is first put in place, early in development. 
you have to have mutations that are expressed early in development. They've got to be viable, and you've got to be able to pass them on to your offspring. Now, this part of the puzzle comes from evolutionary theory. Now, here's the kicker. Those kinds of mutations, the ones that occur early in development, are those that the organism is least likely to tolerate. And the reason for that is they cascade through development. Think about it this way. A human uh, father sitting in an obstetrics ward. His wife's about to deliver. He's waiting there nervously, and in comes the OBGYN with a sad look on his face, and he says, uh, Sir, I'm sorry to report your child has a macro mutation. No human parent wants to hear that. No. And you know why? Because no one thinks that's good. No one thinks that's good because our experience is it's not good. Mutations Though, don't make you better. No. Those kinds of changes are overwhelmingly destructive. And the problem for evolution is we've got a variety of different body plans. So each of these species has been examined in great detail by developmental biology. This one in particular, Drosophila melanogaster, is a common fruit fly. If you've ever had, you know, a really overripe fruit sitting on your kitchen counter, you may have seen these flies buzzing around. They're quite small, but they have brilliant red eyes. Hmm. C. elegans is a very small nematode. It's a kind of a worm that you find in the soil. Only about a thousand cells in the adult, so it's a really small animal. But even this tiny little creature has highly specified development. We'll come back to that later. The purple sea urchin has been examined by uh, a developmental biologist at Caltech named Eric Davidson in great detail. The point of this image is to show you that these plans, these structures or architectures aren't the same. So here there's no skeleton at all. Here there's an exoskeleton. But here we have a five-fold symmetry. If you took off all of these spines and looked just at the test of the sea urchin, you'd see a five-fold pattern that's completely unrelated in terms of its form to these two. How did these different body plans come from a common ancestor? That's the evolutionary puzzle. So the fruit fly that I showed you belongs to this group, the arthropods. That sea urchin is over here with the echinoderms. And you see others here as well. Now, the challenge for evolution is to derive all of these different architectures from some common ancestor. That's what Darwin believed and what is taught today in evolution. Now, here's the neo-Darwinian story. This is what you would get from a textbook. All of those different animal groups came from a common ancestor. It's unknown, but We'll grant that for the time being, by the process of natural selection. The variation, the raw materials for natural selection was small scale. These were small kinds of changes. Now, here's a cartoon showing this theory. This form, called here urbilateria, is actually hypothetical. What this word means is original bilateral ancestor. Each of these forms is bilaterally symmetrical. We're bilaterally symmetrical. Okay. Two arms, two legs, and so forth. Um, and there are two different ways of representing it here. The problem is when these forms initially appear in the fossil record, in the so-called Cambrian explosion, there is no fossil ancestry beneath them. It's like they were planted there, said Richard Dawkins. Now. There's a problem for evolution in terms of the raw materials for natural selection. A moment ago, we were pointing out that macromutations destroy animals. So the neo-Darwinians, such as Theodosius Dobzhansky, said we need to use small-scale variation to explain large-scale change. And uh, he recognized an additional difficulty it seems to require time on a geological scale that we don't have access to. We can't look at the whole process of evolution over time. So he said, we've got to extrapolate from what we can observe to what we can't observe. In terms of uh, this diagram, he says, imagine a starting population here. Let time run. And if your original range of variation is there, with the passage of time and natural selection operating, 
The argument is that you would have genuine novelty arising with enough time and enough variation. The claim from the neo-Darwinians was the variations we see today among fruit flies or nematodes, purple sea urchin, that those provide the raw, material, raw materials for evolutionary change at all scales. Now, this might not be true. Just in terms of evolutionary theory, Dobzhansky knew that many evolutionary biologists didn't actually accept this. In fact, his own mentors in Russia, before he came to the United States, coined the terms micro and macro evolution to put a qualitative distinction between those two processes. They didn't think you could go from micro to macro smoothly. They thought there was a big difference there. So Dobzhansky says, I'll use a reluctant sign of equality, micro equals macro, and we'll try to push that ahead as far as we can. My thesis is, we now know that this is not true. The problem is where do we go from here? Now, let me describe very briefly some of this research. Christiana nusslein folhard and Eric Wieschaus won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1995 for experiments that they did in fruit flies, this was published in Nature, that amount to a kind of reverse engineering. So they're adding knowledge in this portion of this diagram, in the area of developmental biology. Their experiment was quite interesting. What they did was generate thousands of mutations in fruit flies at different points during development, going from the fertilized egg to the adult fly. And they noticed that in general, the earlier the mutation was expressed, the more catastrophic its consequences uh -huh. downstream, which makes sense. It does. Because when you, as the cells divide, if the mutation is already there, it's going to be, have a greater consequence. Yes, it'll spread downstream. Right. Now this figure from their paper shows what they discovered. On the left-hand column, you see the normal larval forms. That's how the larvae, the maggot, if you will, would look if no mutations had been induced. In the right-hand column, we see the mutants. Here's one, here's another. And you notice that they're dramatically different in their appearance when you compare them to the normal larval form. The reason for that is these particular mutations are enormously disruptive of you, you know, the normal development, development of the yeah. fly. Now, all of these mutants, here's another one here, they're dead. They're what are known as embryonic lethals. They're not raw materials for future evolution because it's all over. The mutation was too severe and it took down the whole system. Doing this over and over and over, Nusslein Folhard and Wieschhaus were able to reverse engineer Drosophila development to see what proteins expressed at what time were necessary for normal development. There's that point again, and it's not hard to see why. Given the way that development works, one cell to many cells, it should be clear that these early mutations that affect the overall form of the organism, because they're occurring randomly, without design or intent, are overwhelmingly likely to disrupt what needs to happen. It's almost as if the fly says to us, if you want me at all, I need to have two eyes, six legs, two wings, a gut, and so forth, all in the right position. And to have that, you can't mess with this. <laughs> okay. This diagram shows some of the major events in fruit fly development. For instance, this is the starting point. It's a single cell built by the mother and she puts in place the information, for instance, for the head to tail, front to back axes of the body plan. Now at this point, this is a big open space and proteins are diffusing here that will set up a gradient further subdivided by other genes that eventually, if all goes well, gives you the larval form. Now, what Nusslein, Folhard, and Wieschhaus discovered was mutations that are expressed at this stage tend overwhelmingly to cascade downstream. Sure. And the consequences are bad, enormously destructive. It really is a kind of destructive reverse engineering. Now, that finding is quite general. You can see it, for instance, in the little worm that I talked about a moment ago, C. elegans. And it really is an elegant creature, as its name implies, beautiful tapering shape. This creature 
is notable in that all of its development has been worked out in a single cell detail. Here's the early cell lineage of that nematode. Now what I'm going to show you is the following. There's our starting point. It's a single cell, the fertilized egg. The first event in its development is division into two daughter cells, which themselves divide, and so forth. And you see what's happening here is the expression of a complex lineage leading eventually to the thousand cells in the adult. Now what's interesting about these different cell lineages is they know where they're going. Let's take a look at the next slide. You can see that, for instance, here on the right, coming off, this is the germline coming down this way. These are the cells that will give rise to the ovaries and sperm in the uh, adult. And they're, they're segregated right away because this is, these are the cells that will be keeping track of the instruction set for the whole organism. But some of the other groups here are, for instance, muscle, nervous system, pharynx, the gut of the worm. This is something that actually, when it was worked out, this cell lineage won the Nobel Prize for John Sulston in the United Kingdom. And in fact, I think it's, it's really revelatory that when you see this all the way out to the, the final endpoint, it's an it's a, a unfolding process of such complexity that really ought to take your breath away. Well, it's fascinating, and it sure is complex. We want to talk about the implications of that, and we'll do that as soon as we come back. Don't you go away. Today's guest on Origins, Dr. Paul A. Nelson, Ph.D., is a philosopher of biology and evolutionary theory. Dr. Nelson is currently a fellow of the Discovery Institute and adjunct professor in science and religion at Biola University. Paul lectures frequently regarding the intelligent design debate at colleges and universities throughout the U.S. and Europe. He has appeared in several films on intelligent design for Illustra Media. One video he would like to make available is titled Metamorphosis. To order the DVD, call 800-266-7741. To contact Dr. Nelson, write to Biola University, 13800 Biola Avenue, La Mirada, California, 90639. We are back with Dr. Paul Nelson. Now, Dr. Nelson, I have an observation and a question. If I'm hearing you right, it, you seem to be saying that for macroevolution to work, which is necessary if we're going to have all these different shapes and forms of animals, yep. that there has to be mutation early on in the process. That's exactly right. But if we have that, it seems most destructive to, to the, uh, to the uh, animal itself. Yes, developing organisms do not tolerate mutations early in development that affect their overall form. What happens is the cells don't know what to do. Their instruction set has been changed, and the, the negative consequences cascade downstream. So if we go back to the macroevolutionary scenario where all these different animal groups have a common ancestor, we run into the same problem. So we have our hypothetical common ancestor here, Urbilateria. And if we move, out, move on and consider that as an animal, the same problem would recur. It probably had, you know, a few thousand cells. Two different ways of representing it here. One's just like a little schmoo, a little worm. In the other cartoon, it's got a mouth and paired sense organs and so forth. Anyway, this hypothetical animal would have needed to go a through a developmental process of its own. Sure. You got the same problem. To change its form into something like an arthropod, something like a chordate, something like a brachiopod, let's say, you'd have to have those early mutations. They'd cascade downstream and the whole problem comes back. Just by pushing it back a generation doesn't solve the problem. Doesn't solve the problem. Yeah. So the difficulty for evolution has really made people scratch their head. And John McDonald, I think, saw this clearly almost 30 years ago. Now, the way he put it is in fairly technical language, so I'll translate this for you. He said, those genes that are obviously variable within natural populations, and you know, you just look at human beings, there's a lot of variation. Hair color, sure. eye color, height so forth. 
Those genes that vary don't seem to lie at the basis of major change, changing our overall body plan. The genes that do that, that regulate that process of development, do not vary. Because if they did, the consequences would be catastrophic. So in the original publication where he spelled this out, he actually put this conclusion in italics. This great Darwinian paradox has not been solved. And in terms of his own career, he moved off to try different and I guess you could say really non-Darwinian explanations for how evolution happened. Eric Davidson is another evolutionary biologist who's addressed this problem. And he said, look, micro and macro evolution are just not the same thing. He said they're as different as apples and oranges. And the kinds of small scale variation that we might see, let's say in a population of fruit flies, don't really apply to the question of the origin of the fruit fly itself because you're dealing with different scales of phenomena. Minor variation, we have plenty of evidence for that, isn't really relevant to the question of building the whole body plan. In fact, in a paper last year, Davidson was quite blunt. He said, neo-Darwinian theory gives rise to lethal errors. In fact, it's worth reading this because it's so plain spoken. Please do. Neo-Darwinian evolution assumes that all process works the same way, so that the evolution of enzymes or flower colors can be used as proxies for the study of the evolution of the body plan, just what we've been talking about now. It erroneously assumes that change in protein coding sequence can cause changes in developmental programs. Again, we have this qualitative distinction that he's trying to emphasize. And it erroneously assumes that evolutionary change in body plan occurs by a continuous process. All of these assumptions are basically counterfactual. Now that's a blunt statement. That's saying we have got to rethink evolutionary theory if we're going to grapple with this problem of the origin of body plans. So my bottom line once again, research on evolution done within the neo-Darwinian framework itself over the last 30 years has shown that that framework is false. Where do we go from here? I think we need to go back to this paradox. And personally, I would challenge this and this. I think natural selection is real. It's a real process. It can affect populations. But it doesn't do what Darwin thought it could. It doesn't do as much? It doesn't do as much. It does refining. That's right. It's a and tweaker. It's a tweaker not an overall architect. So it might change the color of your hair. It's not going to change your body structure. You're not going to lose your head. <laughs> You're not going to gain another arm. These are, you know, different scales. Yeah. And for different scales, I think you need different theories. I would also challenge common descent because, to me, the evidence indicates animals don't want to evolve, if I can put it that way, as evolution requires. Those poor little fruit flies have been exposed to practically every mutagen known to human beings over a hundred years. And a one consistent signal has come back from them. If you want us at all, don't tinker with our fundamental development. So that sort of underlines, no, there isn't going to be the major changes that are necessary. At least not as neo-Darwinian theory has postulated. Intelligent design doesn't have this problem, does it? No, because intelligent design is free to consider explanations like what intelligence does. You know, if you have a developmental process with a clear target, but that target is some distance away, what kind of cause do we know that can hit a distant target? A mind. Uniquely in our experience, intelligence is able to bring together the materials that are necessary to achieve a distant functional goal. Natural processes don't have brains. They don't have minds. They can't do that. So I think the toolkit of science needs to be expanded so that we can adequately explain what we see. And that's exciting for our culture because it will drive us back to the truth. In my eyes, the real problem is the philosophical foundation of the theory, which says if you're going to do science, you're restricted to a toolkit of just material physical causes. We know that can't be adequate, though. You, you know, just look around you. The people watching this program, for instance, are watching it on devices that require intelligence for their very existence. Right. Uh, and I think intelligence is real. It's part of the universe. It brings about effects that can only be explained by reference to 
a mind or intelligence, and a healthy science will use all the possible causes at its disposal, not setting some aside, saying we're not going to use those if we don't like the implication. Well, I like the way you're thinking, and I, I like the answer you give, that there's obviously intelligent design to, uh, to make all of this work. You know, usually, my friends, when we close the show, I appeal to believers to hold firm to their faith and to their Christian worldview. Today, I want to end the show by talking to the skeptics out there, or perhaps to the evolutionists who are listening uh, and, and, and considering what we're talking about. I just want you to think about what we said today that there are neo-Darwinists who are saying that the facts that they're looking at don't add up to the conclusion that they've used uh, all along. And I would like you to consider putting God in your toolbox, understanding that there is uh, intelligent design and there's really no other way to explain where we are. You know, it's God's view He created you. And in the end, that should be your worldview too. I hope it is and I hope you'll join us again here soon on Origins and until then, God bless you, my friend. Thank you, sir. It's so good having you here. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program, number 1303, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.